today we'll be taking a look at this book. It is um, William Tyndall's 1526 translation of the Greek New Testament into English. We'll take a look here at the cover. Feel free to pause the video at any time. More information here on the back. It, uh, there are two printings, one from the British Library with this ISBN, one from Hendrickson, which is what you see here with this ISBN. The dust jacket also has information here on the inside of the front and the inside of the back cover. To give you a sense for scale, I have my Cameo out. Cameo is a bit taller, a bit thinner. My Cameo is the New Testament, Old Testament, and the Apocrypha. So it's actually comparable in size, just a bit larger than our Tyndall Greek New Testament, not Greek New Testament, our Tyndall New Testament in English. The book is six and three quarters of an inch tall, four and three quarters of an inch wide, and one and a half inches thick. We'll go ahead immediately after I take off the dust jacket so I don't damage it. You can see the cloth of the board. It's a black. There's the spine. Nothing on the back, bare back. The text is, uh, in a single column, as you can see, each column is about 67 millimeters wide, and I count about 46 characters per line. There are as many as 33 lines of text per page. Page dimensions are quite small, 164 millimeters tall, 113 millimeters wide. So that's about 6.45 inches tall and 4.45 inches wide. As you can see, the text is written in a black letter or gothic type script. It takes a little getting used to, to be able to read. Margins vary about, but at the top, from the top of this title to the edge is about 12 to 14 millimeters at the bottom, from the bottom of the lowest line of text is 31 to 33 millimeters. The inner margin can be as much as 14 millimeters. And the outer, and I'm counting from the edge, the right edge of the text to the edge of the paper, is about 30 to 32 millimeters wide. The font in the text is about 10 points. When I compare a capital or a lowercase to Times New Roman, Height-wise, it's about the same as a 10-point Times New Roman. The line height is 3.34 millimeters. That's 9.5 points. So if to your eye it appears to be a little closely packed, that's because it is. Text is uh, broken into books and chapters. So here is the heading for chapter 7. We're in Romans. But they'll, you'll see that there are no verse numbers in the text, and that's because those weren't used in the New Testament until Robert Estian put them in his 1551 Greek New Testament. There are limited references in the margins. They're in kind of a script writing here. So we'll take a look at one or two of those later. This is clearly Proverbs. This is Deuteronomy 31. The paper has a semi-gloss sheen to it. Hard to see it here in this light, but there is a bit of a gloss to it. Light sheen. I uh, measured the sheet thickness to be 81.5 micrometers. My estimate of the, estimate of the paper weight is 74.5 GSM. The, as you can see, the color of the paper in the original is beige, so you have this sort of a baby powder outer boundary, and then where they printed the actual Greek New Testament that uh, resides apparently in the British Museum. That's in a beige color. There is minimal show through. You can see some, say, here if you look between the lines, but really it's not very noticeable. 
I haven't found any print non-uniformity either. There are no places here where I find the ink to be particularly dark or particularly light. Words of Christ are in black, as you would expect, since uh, red letter Bibles were introduced, I think, in the 1890s originally. There is no differentiation in the font for words that Tyndall supplied for clarity, so you will not see anything like an italic font here. There are no book introductions. The book titles appear at the top of the right-hand page, so here we know we're in the Gospel of St. John. Notice how John is spelled. It's uh, an I-H-O-N. The I looks like a J in that script. <coughs> um, page contents are not shown. All you know is that by looking in the in the book itself that you're in chapter 4 here, beginning chapter 4. Um, there are sheet numbers, not page numbers. And this is kind of interesting here. So this is sheet number. C is 100. Those are actually X's. The V with the line and the curl, the curling line through them are X's. So that's 123. Sheet number 123. The back side of sheet 123 has nothing on it to indicate that you're on sheet 123. There are no headings in the text. All you have, like I said, is these uh, chapter numbers to divide the chapters. And they are indicated by Roman numerals, so that's Roman numeral 4. Books do begin on a separate page. So if we look at some of the smaller books at the back of the Bible, First Peter, this is a uh, first epistle of John. He actually calls it the first epistle. The first epistle of John the Apostle starts on its own page. And a few pages along we come to the second epistle of St. John. So the books do begin on a separate page. At the end of the New Testament, we'll move on to the end of the book of Revelation. We come, so here's the end of the book of the Revelation of St. John. We come to Tyndall's to the reader. So this is uh, an epistle from William Tyndall to the reader of his New Testament. Now I have the New Testament up on a stand here at this uh, epistle to the reader from William Tyndale. And we're just going to take a look at it to see how difficult it is to read. So here we have a, a drop cap, an illustrated cap that with the letter G. So, give diligence, reader, I exhort thee. Notice this R, this R here, looks rather like a Z or a 2 whereas the R at the end of reader looks like a normal lowercase r. I exhort thee that thou come with a pure mind. The slash here is uh, the way they did a comma in those days. With a pure mind, and as the scripture saith, with a single eye, comma, unto the, you have a W-O-R, and then this double slash here is how they hyphenated words for separation. So we're breaking a word at the end of the line here. And the word that we're breaking is in fact words, W-O-R, words of health. Uh, and the line over the A indicates that there's a missing letter there. And of course, it's got to be in. And of eternal life, by the which, if we repent and believe them, we are born anew, created, afresh and enjoy the fruits of the blood of Christ which blood crieth not for vengeance as the blood of Abel but hath purchased life love favor grace blessing and what forever is promised in the scriptures to them that believe and obey God and standeth between us and wrath, vengeance, curse, and whatsoever the scripture threateneth against 
unbelievers and disobedient, which resist and consent not in their hearts to the law of God, that is, right, holy, just, and ought so to be. The, uh, the epistle to the reader goes on, uh, note the difference between the law and the gospel, etc. There's a lot here that uh, seems to me, from my limited knowledge of Lutheranism, to be Lutheran in character, which, which would really comport well with the time that this was translated. And it goes on for three pages, so you can pause that and read that if you like. It looks like someone made marginal notes here in the hand. And then there's the errors committed in the printing, so we have errata that go on for a few pages. Two and a half pages of errors. Someone's written something on the back of a page here, and two blank pages. And then here we have a handwritten inscription, both in English and in Latin. And here's the uh, Latin inscription, and then this note down here says, the inscription above was transcribed in 1787 from, I believe, an original half-length picture, large as life, then in the possession of Matthew Howell, Esquire of Cromsall or Cromfall in the county of Gloucester, who married a lady of the name of Tyndall, an immediate descendant from this venerable reformer. I don't know Latin, so I can't try to translate the inscription for you. Uh, mine seems to have some discoloration here. I did buy this used. It's still in print and it's still available from uh, places like uh, Amazon and Christian book distributors. So as you saw, there were no maps in the back. There are no maps in the volume. There is this one gold uh, ribbon marker which has a weave pattern. It reminds me of what uh, the Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft uses in their Greek New Testaments. It is five millimeters wide, so very thin as ribbons go. 232 millimeters long, but I think it's long enough for use. It extends at the diagonal. It has um, head and tail bands, and they're kind of a dark gray and an off-white. I'm sure the Crayola has a name for that color, maybe gunmetal. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's a dark gray. We mentioned that the covering is uh, a normal cloth over board. It is a sign, sewn binding, and you can see the stitches in various places here. Uh, in the back, in my copy, there are only three stitches visible. There's one here, one here, and one here. But everywhere else I've looked, there were four. So this may, must have broken and come out back here at the very back. Although it's sewn, it does not lie open easily. Now here it does well, but if I get up into Matthew, even if I press it down, it wants to raise up and flop open. There is an introduction at the beginning. Let's go look at the beginning. We have uh, the normal paper, heavier paper. We have the first title page here. Second title page, which mentions the translator, William Tyndall, and then an introduction by David Daniel. And the copyright page, 1526 edition, copyright 2008, published in the UK by the British Library, and that's their ISBN for the cloth edition, printed in China, and mine is the first printing from August 2008. Here's the introduction from Daniel, and... Uh, let you read that by pausing it if you like. Mention something of the character of his translation skills. Uh, about the type of English he uses, he doesn't rely very much on large words of Latin origin. And it goes on. Some more background about England in those days.
relationship to the King James Version. He uh, kind of downplays here in this paragraph the relationship with Wycliffe's earlier translation out of the Latin. He finds it quite the earlier translation to be quite awkward and Tyndall, Tyndall to be graceful. He mentions that uh, Tyndall was educated at Magdalen Hall, Oxford. He uh, dis disbelieves uh, what Fox writes about Tyndall working in Cambridge as well. At least that's the way I read the introduction. And uh, talks about how Tyndall moved to Worms to live among English merchants there. And he never finished the Old Testament, so he worked on the Old Testament, did part of it, and I think that was finished by Coverdale later on. This facsimile um, was printed, is a facsimile of an edition printed in 1526 by Peter Sheffers Press in Worms. Original is a small octavo. And they tell you, uh, give you a few clues here about how to read this, this paragraph here. So after the introduction, there's a, another title page for the New Testament. Then the appears to be an original title page here. Something written in hand on the other page. It gives the year, 1526. Nothing on the back side except something perhaps in very light ink or pencil. And then you are at the Gospel of St. Matthew. This is the first chapter. This is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son also of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and so on. To uh, give you a sense for the translation, I've turned to the second chapter of Luke, and we'll just read a bit of it. I might get stuck in places, but we'll give it a try. Uh, hit, as in it, uh, it followed in those days that there went out a commandment from Augusta, the emperor, that all the world should be valued. This taxing was first executed when Serenus was lieutenant in Syria. And every man went to his own shire town, there to be taxed. And Joseph also ascended from Galilee, out of a city called Nazareth, unto Jewry, into a city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his wedded wife, which was with child. And it was fortuned, oh, I'm sorry, and it fortuned, while they were there, while they there were, her time was come that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her first begotten son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and layeth him in a manger, uh, because there was no room for them in the holstery, for them within in the holstery. I guess hostry must be like an inn. It's a place where one is hosted. I think that's probably an archaic word, meaning that. And there were in the same region shepherds abiding in the field and watching their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord stood hard by them, and the brightness of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Be not afraid. Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy that shall come to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And take this for a sign. Uh, ye shall find the child swaddled and laid and laid in a manger. And straightway there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly soldiers 
lauding God and saying, Glory to God on high, and peace on the earth, and unto men rejoicing. While we're in this uh, portion of scripture, I want to draw your attention to this verse. Uh, this is Luke 2.22, I believe. Uh, and it reads, And when the time of their purification, after the law of Moses was come, they brought him to Jerusalem, etc. Um, there is a reference here. And you can tell this is probably Leviticus, just from the structure of the word. But unless I think you know Latin numbers, you don't realize that's 12. But I think it must be 12, because the reference is to Leviticus chapter 12. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, though, was it says their purification. Now, Tyndall, of course, was translating from an edition of the Textus Receptus, but he was translating from one of the early pre-1526 editions of Erasmus. The King James Bible is translated on later editions of the TR, and in Luke 2.22 it says... And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished. So, is it their purification or her purification? Um, the TR is not a single reading here. It gives a variety of readings across the scriptures. I realize they're minor, but there are variations. And here is an example of one. There's another difference due to the text that's being translated being different. Uh, Tyndall reads, uh, Ye lust and have not, ye envy, in James 4.2. But the King James Version has, Ye lust and have not, ye kill. And that's because they are translating different editions of the Textus Receptus. And in what is perhaps the favorite passage for showing distinctions amongst TR editions, Revelation 16.5, Tyndall reads, And I heard an angel say, Lord, which art and wast, thou art righteous and holy. So it does not say, and shalt be, the way the King James says, as it uh, apparently on the basis of a speculation on the part of uh, Beza. It's interesting also that uh, Tyndall appears to have taken righteous from earlier in the verse and combined it down here with holy rather than put it up here at the beginning the way the King James has it. Well, I, personally I really like this um, facsimile of the 1526 Tyndall New Testament. It is tricky to read. It's hard to get used to all these uh, strange ways of writing characters and the odd uh, non-uniform spelling. Uh, many of these marginal references are kind of hard to make out. This, I think, is straightforward enough. Just above my finger, it's saying the parallel passage is Matthew 12, Mark 8, and Luke 11. L-U-C-E must be the Latin version of Luke. But some of them are a little bit inscrutable. Is Marci Octavo uh, the 8th chapter of Mark? I think so, but I'm not sure. But I think it's very well done. It's a nice sewn binding. Uh, the paper has very little show through. Do you have the difficulty of getting used to the black letter text? But I think in time that shouldn't be too difficult to do. And I rather enjoy it. I think this is going to be showing up in some of my translation comparison videos in the future. Um, small, portable, and uh, certainly a conversation piece. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Oh, I just remembered something else I wanted to point out. But I do hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, did remember to uh, like the video. And uh, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel. And we're almost there. I just wanted to show you that after Philemon, uh, you don't see Hebrews.
you can see First Peter. So the order is a little different here. Then you go to Second Peter, and then First John, Second John, Third John, and then they call Hebrews the Epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. Then after Hebrews is James. Be there in a second. There's the Epistle of St. James, starting with the first chapter. Also a neat little woodcut here. Illustration. Uh, as I said, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time.